secure. Let's all stand prepare our hearts to receive God's word. The title of my message this morning is The Fullness of Joy. How many of you like to come into the fullness of joy experience in your life and, 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 and just kind of stay there? Take it to an elevation of, you know, 35, you know, the, the pilot gets on the radio and he says, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached our cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. Uh, enjoy the ride. Well, you know, we'll be landing in so-and-so in such and such amount of time, you know. The ladies or the, the uh, staff, what do you call it, uh, Flight attendants will be administering refreshments to you in a few minutes, you know. So how many of you like to go to, the, how, how many of you like to reach the elevation of the cruising speed of the fullness of joy, Amen. enjoying the refreshment that comes from the presence of God? Amen. Let's raise our hands up. For the Father God, we just raise our hands to you as an acknowledgement that you are our pilot, Lord. Not only you are our pilot, but you're our co-pilot. And Holy Spirit, you're our navigator. And Lord, Lord Jesus, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the comforter that brings comfort to us in all of the situations and circumstances of, strife, of life and strife and duress and situations that we find. Lord God, I just pray that you would take us to cruising altitude of the fullness of joy this morning, that we might cruise at that altitude, that we would be in, a, in the safe hands of you, Lord God, and the control of you, Holy Spirit, that we might have the fullness of joy by abiding in you and you abiding in us, that we might come to that place of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit that you promise us in your word. Bless us now, I pray, through the word. Holy Spirit, give each of us an ear to hear, a heart to receive, and a willingness to obey what you're saying to us this morning. For your honor and your glory, Jesus, I ask this. All God's people say, Amen. 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 Turn to John 15. Turn to John 15. First 11 verses we're going to look at. This is a, uh, this is a passage of scripture that you've heard before, I've preached from before. Uh, this is a uh, powerful promise, powerful principle that is here. Uh, I love all the red words from uh, the beginning of 13 all the way to the end of like 17, 18. It's the longest discourse that Jesus had. And uh, this is kind of like final instructions before he leaves planet Earth. You know, his final instructions before he's uh, about to be crucified and not leave planet Earth, but be crucified and, and uh, be pl uh, placed in the grave. So um, how, many, how many of you think that like the final instructions from Jesus before he leaves is pretty important? I think the whole thing's important. Genesis to Revelation is important. But let's give our attention to these 11 verses in John 15. Jesus said this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. If anyone does not, I want you to start saying the word abide with me. It appears 11 times. It appears 11 times in 10, I'm sorry, 10 times in 11 verses. So when you see the word abide, and I'm going to read verse 5 again. We're going to continue. When you see the word abide, say it with me if you would. I am the vine, you are the branch. He who in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them, and they are burned. If you, in me, and my words, in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be, what? Full. Full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than he lay down one's life for his friend. 
So we see this word abide in here 11 times. This is abiding in the vine, abiding in Jesus, Jesus is abiding in the Father, us abiding in his word. All of this is interesting that it's, it, it comes to the conclusion, all of this he says for this reason, these things, verse 11, he tells us why he just went through this whole abiding discourse with them. Verse 11, he says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So this whole purpose of abiding in Jesus and abiding in his word and this connection that we have with him, this deliberate connection that we have with him, is for the purposes of producing the fullness of joy within us. That word fullness means totally filled up to the top. And it's, and it's to the point of being filled to the top to where it's about to overflow. And as soon as it's, it's like, how many of you have been to a restaurant where the, where the waitress or waiter is highly attentive to you? How many coffee drinkers we have here? Preach. Got some coffee drinkers. I got some got coffee drinkers, and I've been. I don't drink coffee, but I've been with people in the restaurant where they drink a couple sips of the coffee, and the waitress walks by and she does, you know, she's, you know, she's, you know, she's going around filling up everybody's cup. And the thing's hot constantly and it's filled all the time. I've been in restaurants where people put their hand over the cup because they don't want any more coffee, and because it's so hot, they can't drink it because she keeps us. She is so attentive that she's keeping it filled to the top. That's what this word fullness means. The Holy Spirit wants to keep us so filled with joy to the top that as soon as we drink a little bit of it and express a little bit of it, there's some more there. Keep it, keep it filled up all the time. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. That's one of the things that he has done. The scripture says the kingdom of God is not food nor drink. It's not natural things. The kingdom of God is supernatural, saints. And following Jesus is a supernatural life. In Acts, it says the kingdom of God is not food nor drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in what? The Holy Ghost. Yeah, so the Holy Ghost is our attentive waiter, waitress, servant person who's constantly keeping the cup full, filling the cup up, filling the cup up. You know? So you cannot drink it. You, you can drink and drink and drink and drink until you're ready to float out of the restaurant when you have a, have a, have a waitress or waiter that does that. So you can drink of the goodness of God, fill yourself to overflowing with joy, and guess what's going to be there? More. It's going to be filled up to the top. It's going to be filled. So he wants us to be at a place of fullness of joy. Now, life is a series of, it's like an amusement park ride, isn't it? Life, the ups and downs of life. I mean, we can go from being joyful to being gloom and doom and despair and about that fast. All it takes is one phone call. All it takes is, you know, not putting your brakes on soon enough and you crash your favorite car, you just got done waxing and you just paid for it last week. You wrote the last check out and it's your car. So you decided, I'm gonna save money. I'm gonna drop the collision insurance. Cars calls cars paid for now and save money and get just liability insurance and boom, you crash your car. All right, anybody that ever happened to anybody? Okay, a few of you have had that happen too. So, so my, yeah, he just did it last week, two weeks ago, he crashed his car. Uh, so the, uh, so that, you know, so, is, you know, we, we don't, we can't allow the, the kingdom principle of fullness of joy is not based upon situations and circumstances, saints. It's based on a relationship. It's based on our identity in Jesus. It's based upon us abiding in Jesus. So even when we get the rug pulled out from under us, and even when these situations in life happen to us, and we stumble for a moment, and we slip into despair for a moment, as soon as I find myself unthankful, grumpy, uh, dissatisfied, uh, gloom and doom, you know, as soon as I find myself in that, I recognize that's the enemy who's come to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to steal my joy. He wants to destroy my relationship with Jesus. And I'm not going to let him have the upper hand on me, saints. There's, a, there's principles that we can apply, and there's things that we can do. To, to thwart the work of the enemy in our lives to come and kill and steal, steal our joy. Jesus has come to give us joy and joy more abundantly. It's not based upon situation and circumstances. It's not based on how many commas you have in your checkbook or savings account. It's not based on any of those things. It's based on us abiding in him. So this word abide, this word abide means to sojourn together. Now this word sojourn isn't something we use anymore. It's an old, old word in English, but it means to travel through life together. So this abiding means that Jesus wants us to travel through life together. When you travel to, he wants to be our Siamese twin, connected at the hip. 
You know, when you're connected to a Siamese twin, I mean, there's never a moment where you're not with the other person, right? You're constantly with that person. So, so this sojourning together is he wants, Jesus wants to be our guide in life. He wants to lead and guide and direct us. The Holy Spirit wants to do that. The Word of God directs us. He wants for us to be, to every waking moment and sleeping moment of life, to be joined to him, so, sojourning through life. The word abide means to, uh, uh, not to depart. It means there's never a depart. There's never a time when, in your darkest moments, saints, when you feel like God's the furthest away from you, he's just as close as he is whenever you've got the Holy Ghost goosebumps and happy smiles and you're jumping and dancing in church. Do you realize that? You know, it's not based on our feelings. It's not based upon our feelings. It's based upon his word. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even if you deny me, I'm, I'm sticking around, Jesus says. Amen? Amen. No, so, so we can't allow a situation or circumstances. We can't allow our lives to be governed by feelings. Feelings are nice, but you know, we, can't, we can't. Joy and feelings are two different things. You know, happiness and joy are two different things. We'll get into that here in a minute. This word abide means to continue to be present. I love that. You can, be, you can be joined at the hip to a Siamese twin and ignore the person, right? And just not be in any conversation. You know, I wonder what happens when Siamese twins have fights and they start punching each other. Who wins? You know what I mean? It's like, you know. <laughs> to continue to be present. To remain as one. I love that. This word abide means to remain as one. Again, there's this connection that's inseparable. You know, we're connected to Jesus. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these things. Well, this abiding, what's he talking about, this abiding? Verse 3 says, uh, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Jesus said this, clean because of his word. His word and our agreement with it brings us into relationship or connection or abiding together with Jesus. Again, Jesus promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. So that's the first thing. When we say yes to his word, we say yes to Jesus. The word faith in the Greek is pistos. And the best definition that I've, I've found with all the Greek guys is that the word faith means to say the same thing. So faith is saying the same thing God's word says. Faith is when you agree with what the word, word of God says. God says it, I believe it, that settles it. You know, there's a connection that's there. That's faith. When Jesus said, you're sinners and you must repent, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you say, I recognize I'm a sinner, I need a savior, and Jesus, you're the way, the truth, and the life, I put my faith in you. Jesus said, if you believe in me, though you die, you shall live, and you'll, you will never die, in John chapter 11. So faith says, I believe that when I die, I'm going to be asked for my body and present with the Lord. I believe the Lord is present with me. I believe fullness of joy is mine. I believe the healing is for me. I believe that God's promises are true, and amen. So what you're doing is you're just agreeing with what God's word says. So we need, to, we need to agree with God's word no matter if our feelings go along with it or not. We need to agree with God's word whether the world goes along with it or not. And I don't know about you, but each day I live, it seems to me like the world's becoming more and more in opposition to the kingdom of God and God's word and a greater challenge of God's word than any time before. There used to be a respect for God's word. There isn't a respect for God's word anymore. It's twisted and it's turned. The, 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 there's a gad of people out there that have, have the ear and the heart and they're speaking the voice of not a, not a true discerner of God's word. They're speaking the word, twisting it and turning it for their own purposes, twisting and turning it, you know, redefining the word for their own, uh, you know, well, you know, that's my, that might be what it means for you, but I, for me it means this. No, it's got to mean the same thing for you and the same thing for me and what it says. What it says is what it says. You know, there's, the scriptures are not up for personal interpretation. One of the final warning in Revelation is the last chapter of Revelation says, if you add to my word, all the plagues that are in this book will be added to you. If you take away from my word, your name will be taken out of the Lamb's book of life, saints. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So we see this, that Jesus, Jesus is abiding. He's saying that you need to abide, abide in me. He's saying, so it's up to us. You get this? It's our responsibility to abide. You know, I used the analogy of the, of the Siamese twin. 
Siamese twins don't have a choice. They're connected. We have a choice. Every single person has a choice. As a believer, you have a choice to submit yourself to Jesus, to abide in his word, uh, to look to him for strength, to recognize that of yourself you can do nothing, to make a daily declaration of dependency upon him. That's what we need to do. We need to wake up every morning and make a declaration that, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, in you, I live and move and have my being. Jesus, you are my life. You are my health. You are my, you know, I do not live by, by raisin, what is that stuff? Uh, cranberry walnut bread from Costco's. You ever get all oh, that stuff? They come out once a year this time of year. I ate a half a loaf in one day, man. So like heavy-duty bread. It takes two hands to carry it. You can't even carry it with one hand. Sometimes you got to, Kathy and I have, both have to get it and put it in the cart, you know. Heavy-duty, multi-grain bread with walnuts and cranberries, you know. So man does not live by bread alone, but what? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God bless you, Caden. Delayed there, but I was in the middle of a run there. I didn't want to stop and say, God bless you. He sneezed. How do you guys sneeze on purpose just so I'll bless you? <laughs> no chewing. You gave up cigarettes. The Lord delivered you from them. So no chew either, brother. So there's, a, so there's abide in me, Jesus says, and I in you. Because you can't do anything. You can't bear fruit. Saints, you cannot, no matter how hard you try, bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Because why? It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of your soul. It's not the fruit of your willpower. It's not your determination to, to get all your ducks in a row and live your life in a proper way. It's, it, it's it because you're abiding and determining and relying upon the Holy Spirit. How many of you have experienced the fruit of your Spirit in your life when you tried to make it happen and it didn't happen, and finally you said, Lord, I give up. I, you know, this is never gonna, I'm never going to have peace. I'm never going to get rid of my anger. I'm never going to get into this thing on my own, Lord. So I, I just give it to you. God, bring it to the feet of Jesus. I lay it at the cross. I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, you find what? Deliverance. You find fruit. You find that there's a ch transformation that occurs. Does anybody, does anybody have a testimony to that? Good. God, by over half of the congregation. Your turn's coming. Pay attention to the sermon. Maybe you'll get it today. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Saints, it's not enough just to pray a sinner's prayer. You know, Jesus didn't say, go into the world and make converts. He said, go into the world and do what? Make disciples. A disciple is a learner, a student, a pupil of Jesus. It's a person who is in the process of transformation. Mind transformation, soul transformation, uh, emotional transformation, personality, not a necessary transformation of personality, but a deliverance of your personality from the kingdom of darkness that has in infiltrated it in your lost state and bringing you into a, the full vibrancy of who God created you to be. He created every one of us unique. We're extroverts, we're introverts, we're all these different kinds of things. You know, we're, we're all these, I love it. I love it that there's no cookie cutter, and I love it that when Jesus comes into your life, he enhances those things about your personality that was created. You were, you were fashioned and formed in the womb, you know, and then along the road, many bumps and many pains and many, many uh, attacks that have occurred to us from the enemy and from others uh, have wounded our soul, and, and it kind of gets convoluted. When we come to find, find Jesus, he comes to set us free. He sets our personality free from the pain and from the, from the sorrow and from the impacts of things that have happened to us, from shame and from guilt. Anybody been delivered from shame and guilt? Yes. Amen. I mean, you know, and don't ever allow that. That's, that's, you're, giving, you're giving the devil glory because the Bible says that Satan is, is the constant accuser of the brethren. So when you receive his accusations and you carry shame and guilt, you're worshiping Satan. What you're doing, you're giving him your attention. You know, you're not saying, Satan, you're my Lord, but you're basically doing what? You're listening to him. Jesus wants us to abide in him and in his word, not to abide in someone else's word. You know, we need, we, need, we need to find our identity in the word of God, not in the words of others, not in the thoughts and imaginations that Satan's placing into our mind. So we have this. So it's, so it's not enough to just to say a sinner's prayer and you're in. You know, no, it's if any man comes after me, let him deny, his, deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, abide in me. My, if, my, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you're going to have a fruitful life. There isn't going to be any fruit because 
lot of people don't have any fruit in their lives. A lot of people aren't experiencing righteousness and peace and joy. They're not experiencing the fruit of the, the nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. Actually, it's all one fruit. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's one fruit, all, those, all nine of those attributes together. A lot of people aren't experiencing that because they're not abiding, because they haven't gone any further than a confession of faith. They're not living a daily lifestyle of confession of in him that we live and move, and of him I, I need you, that there's a daily, daily declaration of dependency upon him. Verse number seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. See, saints, this is so important. How many of you have had prayers that haven't been answered? Or that when you prayed for something, the exact opposite came. So you, you know, there's one thing for God to say no, but there's another thing for you not to get what you're asking for. Anybody not get what you asked for? You know why that is? Because you didn't pray according to his will. The scripture says we pray according to his will. The Bible says that we, we have not because we ask not, because when we ask, we want, we want to heap it upon ourselves. So we want, you know, we want, to, we want to glorify the flesh. We want to feed the flesh. You know, I've, how, many, how many of you recognize that you've prayed some fleshy prayers? Some, some fleshy prayers, self-centered fleshy prayers. Lord, fix her. Fix her, Lord, so that we'll have a happy marriage. That's a selfish, incorrect, wrong prayer. Right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Lord, straighten out my boss so work will be more pleasant. Straighten out my boss. Do you want your boss just to treat you nice so work is pleasant? Or do you care about the eternal destiny of your boss? There's a thought. Are you praying for your boss so that your work, workplace will be better? Or you'll get the promotion that you think you deserve or whatever the case might be? Or are you standing in the gap and praying for your boss because you have a compassion for him and all of his brokenness or her brokenness and all the grief that she, he or she causes you that you recognize that person needs Jesus? If you do that, saints, then now you're abiding. And now you can pray a prayer that the Lord will answer because it's according to his will. Because the scripture says he desires that none should perish, but that everyone should come to the knowledge of salvation in Jesus. Amen. So you can switch your prayer from praying for your own self to be better and just endure the cross, endure the, endure the, uh, the uh, difficulty, and begin to pray, for, uh, pray according to God's word. So when we pray according to God's word, see this is the thing, saints, if God's word is abiding in us, and if it's the, it's the primary thing that's feeding our soul and fashioning our thoughts and, and transforming our actions and our attitudes, then what's going to happen is when we pray, we're going to be praying according to his will. You know, we don't have to think about is it your will or not your will because we're, going to, because we're so full of God's word that immediately when we begin to think about something we want to pray for, it's just a selfish, self-centered kind of a thing. The word's going to come and rise up, and we won't even be praying that thing. But it takes great intentionality. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire, and it will be done. Verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. Saints, that is so, that is so important. That is so important. Don't be a dutiful Christian. Don't do your duty. Don't be a dutiful soldier. You know, you can either, you, you can go and serve in the military because it's your duty and you've been drafted and you really don't have a choice and off to the military you go. You can be told by a judge, look boy, you gotta straighten yourself out. Either you join the military or you're gonna to go to jail. I had a uh, friend of mine just said that here to me recently. So he said, I'm going to see Uncle Sam and signed up and went into the military. So if you just go to the military, how many of you were like drafted and forced? I mean, I, know, I don't know if Saranda was or not. Some of you guys, Floyd went to Vietnam. Uh, some of you guys were, you know, were, were drafted and had to go. Uh, you didn't go, you went because you didn't have a choice. You know, We have a choice. And our motivation for going, how many of you, how many of you, what'd you say Floyd? Oh, I didn't want to go to prison. Yeah, that was the motivation. Either go to jail, go to Canada, or go, or go to Vietnam. Yeah. So how many of you have joined the military because you love the country and you wanted to serve your nation? Is there anybody in here that did that? A few of us. Dave? Zeke? Yeah. Servando? Yeah. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Excellent. I did as well. I did as well. But something got in the way. 
fell in love with somebody, and that threw, totally threw the idea of me leaving for four years out the door because I wasn't going to take a chance coming back and somebody else scooping her up. That's the person's name. That's Kathy. So, yeah. Yep. I was also a little bit crazy because I wanted to go to Vietnam and, you know, be a hero and watch too many of those movies. So the Lord spared me from that. There's a difference between serving your country because you love your country and serving your country because you don't want to go to jail. There's a difference between serving Jesus because you don't want to go to hell and serving Jesus because you love him with all of your heart, saints. It's a huge difference, huge difference. If you're serving Jesus because you're afraid to go to hell, then you're most miserable. It's a miserable existence. It's a duty-bound, you know, which means within you, you want to do the sinful things, but you don't dare do the sinful things because you don't want to die in your sin because you might end up in hell, you know. But if you love Jesus with all of your heart, you don't want to do the sinful things because you know it isn't productive in your life. It doesn't, do, it doesn't honor Jesus. It, defies your, it, it defiles your testimony. It impacts every person that you love and every relationship that you have. So you, know, you, you, you have a totally different attitude and motivation for that, abiding in his love. You need to define your, lens, let, define your life through the lens of love. Govern your, govern your relationships with others by making love foundational and the highest priority. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. We abide in his love by regarding his word, hearing, believing, embracing, and doing what he said, he said and says. Not just the words on the page, but the living word the Holy Spirit is revealing to you. you know, there's, there is something to be said about being sensitive to the Holy Spirit because when he highlights something to you, when the Holy Spirit highlights something to you, give it your full attention, saints. Give it your full attention. If you want to develop a sensitivity to Holy Spirit, then when he's speaking, you need to be listening. And when he says, you better do. Because if you quit listening and quit doing, he's going to quit speaking. And you're going to say, how come I never hear from, I used to hear from the Holy Spirit, never hear from the Holy Spirit anymore. Amen. It's probably because you're ignoring that voice. You're ignoring that still small voice. You're ignoring the conviction to stop whatever it is he's trying to convict you to do. Or you haven't done the good thing that he's trying to convict you to do. And you've, you've resisted that because of fear, because of insecurity, because of whatever, uh, fear of others, all these kinds of things. And what's going to happen is you're not going to hear from the Holy Ghost. So if you haven't heard from him for a long time and you haven't sensed his sensibility, you need to do a little self-assessment. You need to get alone and ask him. You know, Lord, have I offended you? Have I, have I not carried through with something that you said to me when you spoke to me in some way? You know, are we, is everything peachy keen and groovy between you and me, Lord, and the Holy Spirit? You need to find that out. See what it is. Repent. If you are, repent. A righteous man falls seven times, seven times he gets up. Just repent, reformat, get back in that relationship again. Spend some time quietly listening to the Holy Spirit. We need to give, that, give, him, that, give him our attention. remarkable to me again all of this all of this comes to the focal point of verse 11 these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full so see there's a there's a principle here guys that my joy may what remain in you which means what the joy of Jesus can dissipate and leave you to where it's not remaining in you any longer why because you just neglected all the things you didn't abide just as we went through all this stuff you didn't abide, and as a result of not abiding, your joy can di- your joy joy can be diminished, and it does not remain in you. But and the same thing is, whatever level of joy, whatever altitude of joy you're at right now, taking off maybe five thousand feet, ten thousand feet. If you want to get to cruise speed, thirty-five thousand feet to the altitude that he wants us to have, then we do all these things. As we walk in all these things, we're going to be able to increase in our joy. So. Uh, That word remain is, by the way, verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Do you realize that that's, I didn't realize this until like, no, no, just before I came to church. That word remain is the same Greek word as abide. Exact same word. So actually the word abide appears 12 times in 11 verses by taking that word in there. Even though King James, I'm not sure what the other translation says, but the word remain in the New King James uh, is actually the same Greek word. Uh, meno, M-E-N-O is a Greek word. Strong's number G3306, exactly the same word. 
so that Jesus is saying that my joy may be filled up to you complete, remain in you, that, your, that joy might be something in your life that you do together. So joy is, a, is, a, is the partner of life, that, every, that we're doing life in joy. Joy and life are, are, are connected together. Just as we are connected to Jesus abiding in him, we abide in Jesus, we're abiding in joy. There's a connection that is there. That our joy would never depart from us, that it would be, you know, it would be inseparable. It would be a life-breathing part of you. I already talked about the word full. I already used that. So now, how can we experience fullness and keep in that state? Turn to Psalm 42. Let's look at Psalm 42. I'm just going to read the whole psalm. We're going to pick out some high, high points from it. We got some, we're going to glean some insights from, from uh, David's uh, writing here. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim's feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the, uh, of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his soul, his song shall be with me. A prayer to God, I pray to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So let's look at some things here. Uh, first of all, he's talking about the corporate worship service here. Look at verse 4. He says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I, I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept a pilgrim's feast. So he says, I remember I used to go to the congregation and have congregational worship, have a corporate worship experience. So the first thing we can do to experience the fullness of joy and keep in that state is to make corporate worship a priority. Number one, make corporate worship a priority. Saints, there is no substitute for corporate worship. I love to worship, I worship in my car, I worship in my house, I worship in this building, in this room right here, by myself. And I entertain the presence of God and I dance before him, I sing before him, I lay prostrate before him, I play the songs that he's anointed through the sound system, but it is not the same when this room is full of people and we're doing it together. Or there's 15 people on the first Friday. You guys are missing a great opportunity of nonstop, uninterrupted worship uh, for an hour and a half or more on, a, on the first Friday worship that we have coming up not next, two weeks from now, right? Not this Friday, the following Friday, I think it is. So there's something about the corporate ex worship experience. Have you ever, anybody been to like a big thing like a Colosseum? I was thinking this morning, I was meditating on Promise Keepers. Any of you old veteran Christians gone to Promise Keepers? I can remember being in Pittsburgh, being, we drove, we rented two buses and took a bunch of us to Philadelphia. Uh, we we took, went to Washington, D.C. for Promise Keepers, a stadium filled with 50,000 men worshiping God. I'm telling you what, it is awesome, man. Every hair on my body was standing attention to the presence of the Holy Spirit. I walked out of the dugout, or whatever they call that thing. You walk out of the, like a, the seats are going up this way. You know, you got this hickey. You got to walk out into the, you know, out onto the, what, what's that called? Walkway or the tunnel. You go through a little tunnel out to there. I walked out there. We were late. We, were, we had to park like way, way back and had to walk. 
And we were trying to stay together. We had like 30 guys. We had two passenger vans filled. And I'm trying to, you know, be the herd, herd guy, keep herding everybody together. We walked through there, and everybody's standing there with their arms raised up, man. I'm telling you what, you could, you had to like lean into the presence of God and push into the presence of God. 50,000 men worshiping God with all their hearts. I'm telling you what, you want to experience joy, you want to experience the presence of God, get into a corporate worship service. I've experienced that same anointing with 15 people on a Friday night. I've experienced that same thing in, on a Sunday morning. You know, you need to make, make it, there's no substitute for it. You know, Kathy and I's 43rd anniversary was a couple of weeks ago. We wanted to go to one of our favorite restaurants, which is Armstrong's in Moon. Since COVID, Armstrong's has been carry out only. There is, n- I don't know what it is. I do kind of know what it is. You can buy, go to your favorite restaurant, take carry out and bring it home or go to a picnic table or eat it in your car on the tailgate of your pickup truck or whatever. But it is not the same as sitting in that same restaurant and eating that same food. It is not the same experience. I see lots of heads shaking. You experienced that. So it's so not the same that we weren't going to go it. We weren't going to go to Armstrong's to get, our, get one of our favorite meals from there. And I, I don't even look at the menu. I know exactly what I want. I order the same thing every time I go there. She's, I'm so boring, she says. And uh, I'm glad that she's not because she buys other things and I get to taste it. <laughs> but there's a difference there. When you go to the restaurant, there is an atmosphere of corporate people enjoying life, celebrating a birthday, celebrating an anniversary, celebrating a promotion, just in love and happy to be at that place. So the whole atmosphere is charged with, 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 a, with an attitude of gratitude, with a, with a sense of celebratoriness that is in the room, even if they're not believers that, that's there. There's the remembrance sitting in the restaurant. We've been eating there since before we were married. We, the first time we showed up there. They've remodeled the place four times in the last 43 years. Yeah, they have. You know, it's like it's, you can't, we can't even sit in the same place because they keep moving things around and changing it, you know. But so, so there's memories that we've experienced in that restaurant together. There's celebrations of anniversaries and birthdays that we've eaten in that restaurant together. And there's something that when you're there in person, there's, the, 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 there's just the, the impact of the past. I have 43 years of history in this room. Not quite. It'd be a little bit less than that. 41, I guess, since they moved in here. I have some memories over there in the old building. And so there's something about being in a corporate worship service, especially if it's a place that you love with people that you love, that is just endearing, that is empowering, that's impacting, that brings to you the, the, the possibility of the fullness of joy, getting your cup refilled. How many of you ever come to church with your cup half empty? And after some worship, and even before the word or anything, the worship, man, you're already fi- being filled up, man. You're already feeling the presence of God re- replenishing you and refilling you. So make corporate worship a profit- priority. Scripture says in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is, especially as you see what? The day approaching. I think the day is approaching a lot more approaching, a lot closer. I think we're a lot closer to the second coming than we were yesterday. Anybody say amen to that? I think that's a theologically sound, sound statement. Number two, look at verse five. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Take inventory. Why am I depressed? Why am I dissatisfied? You know, wh- wh- what's going on within me? What's, what's happening here? Why are you disquieted within me? Uh, cast down means to be, to, be, to be sink low or to be depressed. Why are you depressed, O my soul? Why are you struggling with depression, anxiety, with fear, turmoil? And why are you disquieted? The word disquiet means why are you murmuring and groaning and moaning and growling? Why are you all stirred up in your soul? Anybody ever moan and growl and murmur and complain? Anybody? Just two people, thank you. Remember the other rest of you liars shall have their place in the lake. Careful, put your hand up when you're asked these questions. Next, so he says that, he set, takes inventory and recognizes what's wrong with me? Why am I in a depressed state? Why am I complaining? Why am I moaning? Why am I growling? Why am I grumbling? What is wrong with me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Saints, this word countenance means, means being in the presence of the glowing face of God. That's what it means to be in the countenance. The countenance is the re, it's, the, it's the glory of God expressed to us and, brought, and, and, and we pick up on that glory. When Moses met with God on Mount, 
uh, Sinai face to face, and he came down with the Ten Commandments, they had to put a sack over his head because the Shekinah glory of God radiated from Moses because Moses had met with God face to face, and the people couldn't stand to look upon it. They had to cover his head with a sack, and for some period of time, didn't say exactly how long, before, that, before the glow of God. You know, I love the glow of God in my life. I love to feel and experience the presence of God in my life, whether it's my own personal pursuit of him, whether it's a corporate pursuit, whatever. I just love to encounter the presence of God. It is so refreshing. It is so, re, so rebuilding. It is so overcoming of darkness. It is so freeing. It is so liberating, saints. You know, you need to, you need to do your soul. As a deer pants for the water, verse 1, my soul longs for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When shall I come and appear before God? When shall I get face to face with God so that the countenance of God and the presence of God can impact me in such a way that I begin to radiate Jesus? The scripture says that we're supposed to be transformed into his likeness. Our goal for, the, for a Christian isn't to get out of hell and go straight to heaven and do not, you know, do not go to hell, do not collect $200, go straight to heaven like the Monopoly game. Our goal is to become changed line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, into what? The likeness of Jesus. Likeness of Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, you're looking a little bit more like Jesus today, this time, than you were last week. Amen. Now, don't make that person lie. You know, we don't want them, we don't have them to have to have to lie. This word countenance is the glow of the face the beaming of personage, the radiance of life and love, peace and joy that emanates from God when encountered him face to face. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the paths of light in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hmm. Number six, look at look verse six. Oh my God, this is number three. Number six, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Miser. So this, number three, is recount what God has done in your life in the past. Remember the encounter, encounters and the wonders. This, this, wait, I'm sorry, did I jump through that? One second here, I, I am in... Oh, no. Wait a second. Okay. Number two. I gave you number one. Make corporate worship a priority. I skipped number two. Okay. Number two is this. Praise and seek God, especially when you feel far from him and don't feel like it. Praise and seek God, even when you feel like you're far from him and don't feel like it. That's that whole idea of seeking his countenance. That's, you know, that, that we just went over that. I just didn't give you the, the bold-faced uh, point that I had here for you. Okay. Now, verse, now, now, number three, I'll give you that. Recount what God has done in your life in the past. Remember the encounters. Remember the wonders that you've had from him. Now, we find that in verse seven. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. In the night, his song shall be with me. So we, we have this. We need to, re, we need to uh, recount what God has done in our lives. We see that in verse 6 as well. Uh, I will remember you from the land of Jordan and from the heights of Hermon and from the hill Miser. The hill of Miser is at the foothills of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in all of Israel, that whole entire area. Mount Hermon is where the headwaters for the Jordan River begins. It's a high mountain. It's in clouds all the time. There's a constant misty, uh, tropical kind of a of a high humidity, rainy kind of thing that goes on, and it, on all the water runs off to Mount Hermon and starts the headwaters of the Jordan River and goes down into the Sea of Galilee, and from the Sea of Galilee it empties out into the Red Sea, the Dead Sea rather, uh, all the way at the end. So all of that area re requires the water of Jordan, that entire area of Israel. Without the Jordan River, they would be in a heap of trouble. They would be in a, a barren desert wilderness without any water supply. So it's saying, what he's saying here is everywhere I look, and it doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem, if you're in Gaza, if you're anywhere in that area and you look to the north, you're going to see Mount Hermon. Even on a perfectly clear day, you're going to see the mountain with clouds around. Anybody ever been 
somewhere close enough where with your naked eye you can actually see uh, like Mount McKinley or um, what's the high mountain in uh, Pikes Peak in uh, Colorado, these other kind of mountain ranges. You're there and you can see it and there's only, on, there's only certain times of the day that you can actually see Mount McKinley, the highest mountain in, the, in, in, in uh, Alaska, highest mountain in North America, uh, 32,000 feet I think it is, because it's in clouds all the time. There's, there's only a few times we can actually get, a, most of the photographs have clouds all around, you never see the peak. We were there for four days in Mount McKinley National Park, never saw, never saw it, uh, just saw clouds. One day was pretty clear, clouds, no clouds in the sky, clouds all over, over top of the mountain. So everywhere you look, you would see this. So what he's saying here is this, is that no matter where I look, God, you're higher than any problem that I have. Any mountain that's in my life, any situation, any obstacle in my life, I, anywhere I look, I look to the north, I look to the, I look under the hills where the help, my help comes from. So I'm looking to you, Lord God, because you're higher than any situation and any, any circumstance that I find myself in. Remember the, the testimonies that he's done for you, saints. Yep, Psalm 42. We're done with, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You said where I was at. I thought you meant like what verse? Psalm 42. Look at verse 8. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. Number four, re remind yourself of what God has promised in his word. God has promised in your words, in his word, saints. Any of you have a promise that you're holding on to that God's spoken to you in his word that hasn't come about yet? Yeah, I have, you know. But, you know, you need to hold on to that. You need to, re you need to remind yourself that God has promised something. You find yourself in a situation that is unpleasant, remind yourself that God has promised you some things. Verse 9 and 10. When the enemy attacks, go to God. When the enemy attacks, go to God. Number 5. Look at verses 9 and 10. I will say to my God, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me and why do I, uh, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? When the enemy attacks you, you need to go to God. Number six, last point, encourage yourself in the Lord. Worship team, you guys want to come up? Encourage yourself in the Lord. Look at verses 11 and 12. You can, verses 11, he concludes this uh, psalm by saying this. Why are you cast down, O my soul? So what he's saying is, dude, you got no reason to be cast down. Why are you being, he repeats that multiple times. Why are you cast down? Hope in God. Why are you cast down? Hope in his word. Why are you cast down? Look, remember the things that he's done in the past. Why are you cast down? Look, he's the highest mountain all around. No matter what situation, circumstance you find, God is more powerful than that. Verse 11, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquiet within me? Hope in God. This word hope there's a, is, has a parallel word in the Greek and uh, in the New Testament hope. And it's not like I hope things are going to get better. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow so we can go fishing. But it's an expectation with anticipation of receiving something that God has promised. That's what it is. This word hope means I am anxiously, not anxiously, I am excitedly, with joy, anticipating the arrival of some blessing or some promise or some fulfillment or some answer of prayer from God. That's what hope means, saints. I'm telling you what, when you get yourself in that mind and you're looking for the promises of God to come, you're going to overcome whatever depression, whatever anxiety, whatever valley you find yourself in. And guess what's going to happen? That half cup or quarter cup or that empty cup of joy is going to start getting filled up with joy. Let's all stand up and worship the Lord. joy of 